Welcome to Unlayered, the show where we explore next generation blockchains. I'm your host, Dave, and am joined by my stand-in co-host today, Mr. Zen Lama. He's a friend of the show, serial guest on Unlayered, and of course, currently working as DevRel at Mona Labs. Zen is joining me today to lend some of his technical prowess to proceedings. Because it's a slightly different episode we're doing today and uh, potentially start of a new series, actually, where we're going to start looking outside of Solana and looking at other very promising nascent ecosystems, uh, which are also looking to scale blockchains, but in sort of fundamentally different ways than we've seen previously. Um, and so kicking off this new series, we are lucky enough to be joined by Alan Orwick, the CEO of Quai Network, which is described as the first truly scalable proof of work network, boasting 50,000 TPS and subsent transaction costs. So very interesting. Be cool to see how proof of work can be uh, used to sort of compete with these other high throughput chains. So Alan, great to have you today. How's it going? Good. Thank you, Dave, for hosting and Kevin for arranging this. Glad to jump on Unlayered and talk more about Quai. As the co-founder of the protocol, CEO of Dominant Strategies and the development company side of it, we've had a Exciting roadmap. So excited to share more and, and jump in on the background here. Awesome. Um, yeah, before we get into the um, the technical bits and pieces, be great if you could just give us a quick uh, piece on your background, how you got into crypto and your journey to Kwai so far. Sure. So I got started in crypto in about 2015. I was in high school at the time, got into Bitcoin and didn't have a ton of money to be investing, but I was just tinkering with the technology. So I've always been a technologist, always been interested in new emerging things and just having the idea of a decentralized money really excited me and jumped in. So went to college at the University of Texas here in Austin and started my computer science degree that allowed me to get connected with people in the Austin area that were crypto and blockchain minded as well. I started Texas Blockchain, which is the undergraduate organization, was the founding president of that, helped grow that organization out, connect people in academia, to people just in the technology scene here in Austin, and then was able to start courses, curriculum, and really create this sort of nexus of blockchain-minded people. So out of that, started a lot of research focused around scalability, zero knowledge, cryptography, hash functions, you name it. Was able to connect with my professor, Suram Vishwanath, who had a colleague, Dr. Carl Kreider, and we started a research organization around this idea of scaling work-based blockchains or having this sharded network. Our first paper was published in 2019, under block reduce and that was a nsf funded sbr phase one backed paper i triple e reviewed and then following that time i was like okay crypto's in a bear market it's 2019 i'm gonna go work at a big company so i actually graduated went and worked at apple as a software engineer was in the business intelligence space on the north and south american supply chain actually worked out of here in austin and then got some big company experience and then come sort of End of 2021, got the crypto itch again and jumped back in full time. That's whenever we got that original research group back together, picked up the research and got our seed round backing from Polychain Capital and Alumni Ventures and have grown Quine Network to where we are today. Awesome. Um, and then for Quine Network, if so a lot of our listeners probably aren't very aware of it. So it'd be great if you could give a sort of 20,000 foot view of yeah. how you're differentiated really from the competition. Yeah, so you alluded to Kwai being scalable proof of work, and we're aiming to utilize the properties of proof of work in a very sort of classical way to achieve the things that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies haven't really delivered. So we want this decentralized peer to peer cash that can be used in a censorship resistant global settlement way. And for Kwai, we're doing this with, from a technical perspective, a hierarchical set of merged mine shards. So these shards are interwoven asynchronously. And when everyone's, whenever someone tells you we're solving the blockchain trilemma, you always have to kind of raise your eyebrow because there's always some trade-off. There's no free lunch in crypto. So what we've done actually is we've introduced a time delay to global consensus as we have these asynchronous shards coming together. So at a more technical level as well, Quai Network is EVM compatible. We have MEV resistant properties through work-based transaction ordering. We also have a unique two-token dynamic that allows us to pair one of the tokens to the price of energy through oracleizing proof of work. So a lot of exciting areas to cover. And at that kind of high level, we see Quai Network 
enabling this proof of work renaissance and having the pendulum swing back towards a new area of exploring proof of work from a fundamental standpoint. So if I can hop in here for a second, yeah. I guess like on, on the vision side, you know, a lot of things that networks have to go through is like, you know, what's the, like, are we trying to be global compute or are we trying to be like money, right? And typically that's a trade-off. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, do you, do you think that's a trade-off? And like Quai as itself, especially with this dual token governance model, um, is it trying to be money? Is it trying to be, you know, the world computer? Like, where does it sit on that scale? And how do you think about that from... Yeah, yeah, Ethereum being labeled the world computer early on, I think that was a good narrative for it. And for Quai, you know, we see money covering three things. So it has to be medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value. So to tackle the money side of crypto, you have to really accomplish those very well. And Bitcoin really only does store value. So if we were to address that, we have to bring those properties into Quai Network, and we've done so to address the money side. So we have some store value-like properties, we have unit of account based properties. We have medium of exchange based properties. Given we can achieve scale to be a medium of exchange, and we have this thing that we can denominate an energy like asset as a unit of account. So we have those covered. And then if you look at the compute side of it, well, EVM compatibility and programmability really cover those. So I see it more of a yes and. We want to have a system that is really utilized globally from a programmable nature of money, because I think money should be programmable as well. We have autonomous agents doing things on our behalf with cryptocurrency now. We have the ability to create any sort of economic mode in any kind of community. So we're breaking down those barriers for access. It's giving the SEC a heart attack, but you pretty much see anyone being able to create this new economic instrument with access to money. So to say they're two separate things, I think is a bit naive. And so with Kwai, we say, well, if we can create this fundamental layer, how do we address all of these problems? Because layer ones are so fundamental that they have to really address the other concerns across both of those categories. And what's the importance here of proof of work? Uh, you talked about the tr uh, scalability trilemma before. Do you think that the current options using proof of stake are sort of lacking in, in one of those areas? What's it bringing? Yeah, so fundamentally, our team thinks proof of work is underexplored and underutilized. So we see it as a truly interesting area and in design space. And that the abandoning of proof of work is delaying a lot of progress in terms of what's possible with blockchain technology. And we don't see people really experimenting as much there as people have been either in proof of stake or just taking proof of stake for its kind of own thing and, and running with it because they say, okay, I'm going to go innovate on the execution side or I'm going to go do stuff on the state side or I'm going to go do things on the data availability side. So they said, okay, proof of stake is good enough for that. And so we sort of revisited those fundamentals and said, if we can take this and improve it, which we have, we can dive into proof of entropy minima and some of the adaptations that we've made to proof of work later in the podcast. But the core thing that we're seeing is that there's a lot to uncover here. And proof of work actually gives us a lot of really good properties that can help us scale the system, keep it censorship resistant, and give these properties of money and programmability together. And the key difference from proof of work and proof of stake are really around just safety and liveness. So proof of stake systems are designed for safety. If the network is having problems sort of at the edge or at high levels of throughput, then it will halt and it will stop progression due to the fact that state can be slashed and we want to preserve the safety of the actors on the network. Work, on the other hand, is based towards liveness. So imagine if there was sort of a US and China fork or if the network went down or internet went down and people were running on their own, well then US would have their own version and China would have their other version and they'd be sort of running on their own. And then whenever everything came back online, there'd be reorgs and there'd be ways for us to sort of find the right chain post that. So that liveness leads to the sort of forking or creation beyond the individual incident of stopping or halting at safety. So the liveness guarantees gives us a really interesting kind of razor edge to walk down in terms of scalability. And so we can, we can jump into proof of entropy minima, but I'll kind of halt there and see if you guys have feedback on that. Yeah, I guess like, um, like I'm, I'm 
I, I do want to explore the proof of entropy minima, mm -hmm. um, but like just to step back a little bit, right? It, it, it seems like the industry has kind of just assumed like proof of stake is the way to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems like it's just like such an easier from like a market perspective to launch as proof of stake right now, right? Um, and so like why choose proof of work, right? And, and I guess like, do you see there being a trade off there or like how, how is your thinking behind that? And more like to put a little bit of a fine point on it, you know, like the, the main argument against proof of work systems is like the energy argument. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you can go into like that a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, but. absolutely. So I, I think it is de facto because there's just been so many tools built around proof of stake to where like if I'm launching a new layer one, I can go fork on top of Tendermint or I can go on top of Polkadot or I can go build these layer twos. And you know, you're not really seeing a lot of layer ones even pop up nowadays. So you're mostly seeing that happen. And there's a ton of issues with layer twos that we can go dive into. I mean, we're seeing even see spike in base post four eight four four and all of the different fun things that are occurring with that. So there's still a lot of problems left to be solved, even in the proof of stake land. For us on proof of work, as I mentioned, underexplored, underutilized, but the main criticism that we see in terms of energy is that there's a lot of ways to improve it. And I'm in Texas, so there's the, the grids and the, the Bitcoin miners that all moved here and all of the natural gas flaring. And the key things that I would tell people is if you're creating this money, literally creating this digital money, this digital currency, you want this sunk cost into it. And so you want the competitive nature of people having to continually keep up with hardware. So I've actually, you know, as a reply guy, reply guy on Twitter, I've gotten into some good debates on this with proof of stake people. And the main debate is <clears throat> with proof of stake, there is no CapEx. You, you simply stake and you get your APY and you continually keep up with the network, but there's not a real effort or cost that goes into maintaining that. So you continually get this compounding effect that will be pretty you know, straightforward over time. With proof of work, there's degradation in hardware and there's also a competitive nature in terms of energy costs for optimization and location. So if I'm getting six cents per kilowatt hour in Texas, but it's 14 cents per kilowatt hour in Germany, well, there's a clear competitive edge there in terms of profitability based off of minor revenue. And so there is an optimization game that occurs in which people have to seek out the lowest cost of energy, which is actually a good thing because then it incentivizes renewable energy. And so you look at El Salvador going and doing volcano Bitcoin mining at its front, you know, Cointelegraph posts that news article and you're like, that's insanely ridiculous. Like, why would anyone want to go do that? Well, it's because now there's an incentive to go tap into these resources. So our team has actually explored looking at landfill gas as an example. So if you go and look at the 4,000 landfills in the United States, all of those are producing methane, anywhere from two to five megawatts of methane a day, roughly, are, are kind of at scale. And so you can go tarp those landfills and you can have either Bitcoin or Quai miners or any sort of electricity output at the edge. And the reason why this isn't profitable or useful for people to move that back into the city or connect it back into the normal grid is it's just not cost effective. So it costs about a million dollars a mile to connect these landfills back to the grids that they can actually be useful for day-to-day -day operations. And proof of work is an alternative way of saying, we're gonna go tarp these and use them for proof of work miners right now. And then when it's cost effective or actually possible to pipe them back into cities, then we have the means of doing so. So I see that as a unique enabler for the future in terms of tapping into these energy sources not only just in terms of landfill gas, but solar, the flare gas mitigation in Texas, as I said, and this is actively being done. So <clears throat> there are many people, especially if you look at Bitcoin, that say Bitcoin's actually you know, carbon negative right now, just because so many people are doing it. And so I think that's a, kind of one of the key things if you're to talk about the energy side. Yeah, I guess uh, like just to play devil's advocate here, and like I, I think you made a pretty good argument, but like you know, some cynical person might say, well, the most energy efficient blockchain is the one that doesn't use much energy. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, like, how, how, how do you think about that from uh, the perspective of proof of work? And then maybe if yeah. proof if this entropy thing plays into this and these optimizations mm -hmm. on proof of work, maybe you could dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So, of course. Transaction per transaction, right, the one that's not using energy is, of course, Literally, more by definition, yeah. using yeah, yeah, more efficient. Yeah. And so yeah. from our side, we say 
if we're creating this monetary base and everything from crypto is monetary related, like I've gone down the private blockchains, I've looked at Hyperledger, I've looked at everything, I've experimented with it, try to create real tangible products. And you have to have the real world economic value transfer that allows for these things to be permissionless and public. And that's the core thing of blockchain. If you try to do anything outside of that, you're not using blockchain or you shouldn't use blockchain. And for these systems that are more energy efficient or don't use energy at all, well, then you have to wonder, okay, like where is this value coming from and where is this value being ascribed or attained to it? And so a lot of that is based off of social consensus. So you get these social sort of values and the idea around it, and it's a more lightweight assertion around the security. And so it's not a problem for Ethereum because Ethereum is so large. And of course, it transitioned from proof of work to proof of stake. And I actually love some of the arguments I hear from Ethereum where they're like, we have the best version of proof of stake because we were proof of work. So we had the most efficient forms of distributing the currency. And then we went proof of stake. So we're better in terms of proof of stake. I've heard that argument a few times. And the way in which I see people that are more energy efficient or having these sort of bootstrapping in proof of stake systems is that's great if you want to be on the programmable side, world computer, do just the computation and have less of the monetary value than that real value outside from the world being attributed to it. So I see proof of work fundamentally as attributing more of that real world value to it and having that backing that gives it a sort of more robust value base over time. And then yeah, for, I think there's for, some, I, oh, I will, go for it. Yeah, I will say for Poem as well. So then if you look at it, if you were to compare Quai to Bitcoin, well, then you're looking at, okay, what's the total energy input or the expenditure around the system and then how many transactions is it processing? So if you were to say Bitcoin only does 7 TPS, 15 TPS, then of course, whenever it's doing 1% of GDP for energy expenditure, then that's super inefficient. Yeah. And there's no way of really comparing that to something that does 50,000 transactions per second, maybe at 10% of that, 0.1% you know, of GDP energy expenditure. And then compare that even then to what does the traditional banking system do? And I know that's kind of a bit of apples and oranges when you look at other blockchains, but still, if we have something that is truly replacing money, then you have to sort of look at, you know, there's people driving to work to go to Wells Fargo. There's wires that rely on all these cobbled databases that are super inefficient. So there's a lot of additional factors if we were to look at it from a global standpoint. Yeah, I think one kind of really attractive property of proof of work is like, you know, I think a lot of proof of stake chains are based on the fact that like if the chain is useful, like the, you know, the state access will then accrue value. Right. But with proof of work, it's very like it's tangible. The energy you put into it is like yeah. the, the value of it in some sense. Right. Um, like you are literally mining like the hash power of your computer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I think it, it, it's very clean. Like I do like uh, how easy it is to reason about like proof of work where it's not like speculative in the sense of like if this reaches scale. Right. And there's a right. lot of value on it, then it can accrue value. Um, but from a proof of work perspective, it's like from day one, you know, you very much see where the the backing, I guess, currency or the backing of the currency comes from, right? Yeah, so. I mean, and so this is being looked at, especially for Cosmos chains. So there's a lot of Cosmos app chains and a lot of them are smaller proof of stake chains. And they're actually using, I'm sure you follow like Babylon and Babylon is doing timestamping on Bitcoin because the liveness given by Bitcoin and the security at scale from a proof of work standpoint can be attributed via timestamps or IBC to these smaller app chains on Cosmos that have long finality delays or sort of longer bonding and debonding times. So that's an interesting use, use case that especially we're exploring in Quai. How do we use this given we have shorter block times than Bitcoin and, and better properties than Bitcoin at scale? So I think that's an area as well where you can even use proof of work for proof of stake, whether you're not doing it as an L2 directly, but just as an L1 looking to have a finality gadget in your consensus, either like Polka step of Comet BFT or some other sort of finalization mechanism within the proof of stake consensus side to utilize proof of work. Yeah, I mean, like we see that in Ethereum, actually, right? Uh, it actually falls back to proof of work when the proof of stake system breaks down. We actually saw that on the network outage, right? Hmm. And, and that's why they maintain li liveness, right? When they had that bug in one of the clients and they weren't finalizing. Well, the reason the chain kept 
going is because it actually fell back to blue for work. Um, so I think that's quite insightful of you. Yeah. 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 Because do you think that then could turn Quai network into like a settlement layer then that competes with Ethereum as a potential end game? Yeah. It's super interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. You definitely could, you know, like a Celestia type with blobs or, or, or Ethereum. Absolutely. So the way we like to see it is we, we want to be as integrated as possible because we see in a layer one that can juice up as much throughput in terms of security you get dollar per dollar with the capex and opex going into the system that is where you need the most economic activity because we don't want fragmentation in silos but ultimately no matter the use case and especially so how disjointed the blockchain space is right now you will get that fragmentation and it's just a matter of how secure is that and what are you doing to improve finalization for those people to have better security at the edge so yeah let's perhaps um, go down that avenue so obviously the current proof of work <clears throat> chains are very slow um yeah very high uh, cost of transactions things like that so how are you overcoming all of those issues what's the general architecture which is getting you from from uh, sort of bitcoin speeds up to solana speeds mm -hmm. yeah so horizontal sharding is the way we accomplish that so in coin network if you look at a diagram you sort of take the classical monolithic blockchain it's just like okay we have a sequence of blockchains in Quine Network, we spread that out. Say, all right, we got many blockchains all working in parallel, and they can operate asynchronously. These asynchronous blockchains are resolved via a hierarchy of header chains almost. So a lot of this research dates back to Nepo Pals, which are sort of the way that we can prove a sort of canonical chain within a work-based blockchain. They also go back to, say, like a Peter Todd's tree chains idea, in which we have a mini sort of depth layer and layer of blockchains. And... A lot of our research also relies on merge mining. So the more classical one would be like Bitcoin and Namecoin, Dogecoin and Litecoin. So mining many blockchains at once. This incidence of having a hierarchy of chains allows us to shard the state without sharding the work. So that was one of the key unlocks that said we can have a asynchronous system that has redundant security. So I can have shard A and shard B, and then eventually these shards will have the same level of security backing them because they share a root that is above them and they are merged mined into that. These merged mine blockchains essentially give us what is called coincident blocks. So if I'm a miner, I'm mining prime, which is the root, one of the regions, which is that second layer, and then the third layer is a zone. So you choose one of the zones. And when you mine, you are mining that slice. So prime, one of the regions, one of the zones. And so if I'm a miner, I'm extending one of those zones asynchronously. I'm not mining the other ones. If I have a GPU, my one GPU is on that one zone. I can have another GPU mining another zone, but essentially I'm mining that one zone there. And what this does is it gives us a lot of other nice properties. Is When I talked about that energy optimization in terms of geography earlier, we actually get now compute optimization based off of network topology because people are going to subselect and subgroup within these shards based off of their uncle count that they're getting and the throughput that they're seeing. So if I'm getting sort of lower latency over in shard three compared to shard one, I might go over to shard three. And if I'm getting higher bandwidth with the nodes in shard three, I might go over and operate there as well. That allows me to reduce my uncle count and increase that throughput from a geographic and geographic doesn't tend directly, but more of a network based topology optimization. And so the key benefits there is if you look at something like Bitcoin, when we say proof of work is slow, well, Bitcoin is a global network. It is huge and there's thousands and thousands of nodes. I think there's like over 100,000 nodes in Bitcoin. It's hard to count because many of them are private. But when you look at how that network operates, it takes about seven hops for all of the data to transmit Bitcoin compared to a Solana that might have 3,000 nodes. I still think Solana is decentralized and it's slowly decentralizing things with uh all of the good upgrades for their nodes. But Solana compared to Bitcoin is only about two to three hops for all the data to transfer. Maybe even, you know, one to two, depending on how well connected you are and if you're the leader. And so with Quai, we can take those properties of Solana and say, we're going to create these subgroups that are one to two hops, two to three hops for all of that data within that shard to propagate the network. But eventually, as they all resolve, you'll get a Bitcoin-like global system or settlement layer that has that same node count and participation across those sub-selecting shards. So we can use work to create that 
And since work gives us those liveness guarantees, these shards can operate asynchronously away from each other and then resolve. Um, so like, I guess my question is like, how do you think about like the usage on the compute side, like mm -hmm. moving uh, across these shards, right? Yep. Because I, I guess what I'm not clear on is like, get, does a single region or shard, like if more miners come onto that, does that scale up that shard or does it scale in the sense of like there are multiple regions to distribute the load to, right? Yeah. Um, and so like, and if you have the multiple regions to distribute the load to, what's like kind of the heuristic between like when you would move a compute to a different region, right? Mm -hmm. And does that happen automatically? And how does it like sync back to the... So yeah, like great question. At some point, yeah. So everything within Quine Network is driven based off of the topology. So the current rate of the network essentially dictates the shards. So if we're only running 200 TPS, we may only need one shards. When we look at Quai on mainnet this summer, then it's going to start with one shard. We're going to say this is all we need because when we launch, we're probably only going to see 20 to 30 TPS. Like fingers crossed, I hope we see that because like that's pretty sufficient demand. I mean, base is doing like 18. Ethereum does like 15 and like we're okay with that for now. And mm -hmm. when we start, we'll launch with that. And as the network begins to progress in terms of usage, then it gets to the point where it's like we're not handling demand at or we're not handling in terms of supply the demand we see at 200, 300, 400 TPS because the network then begins to fragment. So we'll see a higher uncle count and we'll see higher block fill essentially. And so the uncle count means these blocks are getting rejected. They're not, being, they're not becoming canonical because they're not able to correctly reference the right block due to either propagation delays or like state execution delays. So the network physically isn't getting the data to everybody up, fast yeah. enough to, to make that decision. So whenever that occurs over a long enough period of time, then the network will be able to say, well, now we need two shards because we need to subdivide this so that we can optimize in terms of block fill in the block space available. So allowing for there to be two different states to lower the execution time in terms of state tree overhead and the database overhead for rewrite IO. And then also subdividing that so that the network itself can go back and reduce the hops necessary between these subgroups and then expand out. So now if we're running say, you know, 600 to 700 TPS, we'll have two shards. And then that sort of trend continues. So every time you hit a certain throughput limit for a given number of time, you create more shards. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I do believe we're the first people to experiment with that from a work-based standpoint of this dynamic and adaptive on-demand sharding topology design. And so I think that's super powerful because you can't just start out with like 100 shards and if they're not being used, because then there's economic attack vectors because you have subgroups that can theoretically be eclipse attacked or 51% attacked if they're underworked. And so you create these shards over time that are essentially viable in terms of economic demand and creation in which they would be adequately secured and then interwoven back into the chain as necessary. So if you have multiple shards, right, um, am I right in understanding that basically the longer a block is mined, the more synchronous the shards are, right? Is that kind of how it works? So like if you're on two separate shards, right? Mm -hmm. And you and you give it like maybe one second, like the state in those two like sub blocks, let's call them, mm -hmm. right? Is not, it's not ordered together, yeah. right? It's not, not ordered together. Yep. Yeah. But then say I wait 10 minutes, right? And this is getting mined up the tree, right? Yep. And then I inspect that same block, it would be ordered with all the other transactions. Is that correct? That is correct. So you get this eventual okay. resolution and it's almost like a lock step to where these, in a say like a two shard design with one single parent, they're sort of alternating with each other when they can get access to the state looking backwards. So we do that on purpose because then you get that eventual resolution in which we can transfer state. And so that's how we enable within Quai Network the ability to go almost in a decentralized bridging mechanism, this atomic way of transferring state between any sort of shard, we call this external transaction we have added op codes to process this and so the yeah that's that's kind of on the right path there okay so then my follow-up question to that is like how do you deal with like a trade like an arbitrage opportunity mm -hmm. that appears on both shards 
and like two people want to access it, who who is first? How is that rule decided? Right. Yeah. And so there's a lot of fun like, design here. And so you'd likely see, of course, within L2s, we see this. So you get fragmentation of liquidity. I think I'll address that head on. We know that's part of the trade-off design space. And we'd likely see people and economic actors grouping based off of activity. So the way we would explain it to people a while ago, it's like, okay, if you're in Austin, Texas, then you'll have your Austin, Texas money. And if you fly to New York, then you'll have your New York money. And by the time you land on the plane, if you sent it to your other address, you'll be good. And the same thing with like these arbitrage opportunities. So if I'm in a super active meme coin community and I got some devs that I like to work with and people that are in the same, you know, alpha groups as me, then we might all be on shard one and like we're cool to like ape into those projects and hit that early sort of bot announcement and go do that. But I might also have money on shard two if there's a game that I like to play over there and I can interact with that. And the idea would be in order for me to move my money between shard one or in two, that there is a time delay there and I'm okay with that. And that economic opportunity is secured in the same manner over time as it would be if I was just in shard one. And then extending this to your exact example, there would be people that are essentially making that market efficient. So doing that arbitrage, ensuring that we can have the pools balance out between different pairs and then operating that just as we do across layer ones today with bridges or layer, or layer twos today. So there's that same sort of scenario. And I think we'd see it further optimized even within Quai because we have better security guarantees of that base asset. And so when we talk about you know, that fragmentation, the thing that separates Quai is that you're using Quai as that base asset and you have that same level of security. And then you have that programmability across those shards that is fully unique. And so you'll know that even if there's a service, pro service provider that says, I'll give you instant transactions across these shards, that if I chose to not do that, I could still go between the shards just with added time complexity. And it's, it's not massive. So it's not like layer two's 14 days. It's more like two minutes. I think that's why I would like to get into now is this is all sounding very, very similar to Ethereum's modular rollup. You know, there are different execution shards. Eventually, it will get settled onto the, the big L1 effectively. Uh, it takes time to hop between the different shards. It's, it, it's got that uh, liquidity fragmentation and puts the onus onto the user to know which shard they're on, things like that. So what is key differences here and the key advantages? Sure. So yeah, a lot of the inspiration actually goes if you took Ethereum's original old roadmap for sharding, it was like, we're going to mm. start with 1,024 shards and they're all going to be enshrined. It's going to be great. And then they abandoned that, these layer twos. Well, we sort of resonated with a lot of that. We said, how can we put all this in the protocol, to make it efficient? And I, I think when you look at proof of stake, a lot of the sharding can be difficult because it is a subjective system. So the finality delays with proof of stake makes it hard to coordinate shards instantaneously. So I'll say that's kind of a non-starter for some of the technical pieces there. But in terms of the user experience, there's a few key unlocks, and I've used key unlocks a couple of times across Quai because I think there's a, a lot of little pieces of magic here that make it different. And we actually have designed it such that the addresses are specific to shards. So if I'm in shard one, I will be prefixed OX00. And you have to physically grind that address. So it's not a back encoding. It's not just a unique prefix. It's physically derived down the FIP39 or FIP44 address encoding. So you have to mm -hmm. find that address, almost like a vanity address. You have to find that address. And so when you spin up a wallet, like the wallet has to do this. Yeah, it has to grind it for you physically. Correct. So you have to go nice. and, and try to find all of the addresses that you'll need. And that's by design because now a private key that you use is specific to that shard. And if you give me an address, I can know automatically which shard it goes to. And so the developer experience and the wallet experience doesn't have to worry about, okay, I have one address and now I have all these different assets across all of these different layers. Because if you look at a wallet today, it's like, I got my ETH one address. I got my ETH on Ethereum. I got my ETH on Optimism. I got my ETH on Arbitrum. The list goes on. But now we can separate that. And also since it's the same asset itself on the same network, even if we were to have a wallet with many addresses, you'd still just see that one asset Quai because it's using the same network, the same interface, and the same security guarantees, RPCs, and everything else that would allow it to look 
homogenous across all of the shards and have a unified experience there. So we do our best to sort of abstract that through some of these top level interface designs that essentially make it comparable and better than Ethereum layer two fragments. I, I actually think that's like an incredibly cool trick. Like this is done in software a lot where you pull you pull the setup costs forward, right? So that like the the when it's actually running, right, like it, it's much lighter overhead. So pulling that key grinding forward for like a specific, you know, prefix shard is actually like that's actually pretty smart. It's, it's cool. That's, yeah, I mean, from a security yeah. standpoint too, we see it massively impactful because now I think you one have of the a unified largest... address space too at that exactly. point. Exactly. Like, yeah. Well, now if your key gets hacked and your, I mean, EVM compatibility has done amazing things for the space. I won't shit on EVM compatibility, but now I have to worry about okay, if my Ethereum address gets fished or I get, you know, some sort of private key exposure, then I have to worry about all my assets on all my chains, and I have to worry about all of this redundancy and security of like, I don't even remember transacting on Phantom like two years ago, right? So I, I think it opens up a, a, a delicate balance of uh, reuse and, and security there. Your point being that it would only be exposed to a single shard. Right. Um, but does that then mean that if you're hopping then between different shards, you need different private keys and yep. to be storing? Yeah, so in this potential like ETH end game where they were going to have 1,024 shards, potentially it could be like that and someone would have to have 1,000 uh, private keys? Yeah, I mean, I know from my standpoint, I like to spin up new addresses and I like to keep things separate. And so I think that's the right OPSEC. And I'm not an OPSEC expert. I'm not going to act like I am. There's a, people in our company that are way better at it than me and there's people in the Ethereum and, and crypto community that are, are way better than, than uh, at me. But I do think it's it's better to keep things isolated and separated. And so if you were to interact with things across different chains, having that be isolated and secure, not only from a security standpoint, but also a privacy standpoint and and other things that are useful in crypto, I, I think that's useful. Yeah, I actually like think it's quite a good trade-off because the UX portion of it uh, is like quite solvable, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas having the same address on many chains uh, the UX portion of that is actually like harder because the back end has to do a lot more work. Whereas in this system, yeah, the wallet can manage all that for you and the back end's like quite simple, right? It's one address space, you know where you're at. Um, so I, I actually like, like that trade off a lot personally. <laughs> and I think we see a lot of that design in Bitcoin because in Bitcoin, your wallet does a similar sort of setup with sort of gap wallets and having sort of backup. And we're sorting, starting to see that somewhat in EVM land as well. And I believe Vitalik was one of the people that proposed sort of pay codes and having the stealth addresses in which you can just have a sort of publicly viewable key and then you go and then derive all these stealth addresses and then how do we create this wallet compatibility to have stealth addresses. So there's a really interesting area of exploration there. And I think with Quai, we want to uniquely leverage that and tap into that as much as possible. And just to test if, if I'm understanding correctly, but sure. I think earlier you were talking about that on Ethereum, you have ETH on maybe the different chains. On Quai, mm -hmm. would that be different if, say, you had the Quai um, token? Yep. Would it just be uh, on a single chain, single wallet, regardless of which shard you've been interacting with? Does it all sort of convene back to that uh, shard where, where presumably Quai was uh, originally, uh, the, you know, the program was originally launched, if you like? Sure. Um, yeah, so that gets into a lot of interesting game design as well when we go back to network design. So as we have these shards, Quai is being natively minted by these miners across all of the shards, which actually adds as a incentive design for mining optimization. Because when we talk about the balancing, I think this question was alluded to earlier, we didn't get to it, but that allows miners to go say, okay, I can be more profitable on this shard, not only from a geographic optimization standpoint, but from a mining rewards standpoint. So I'm now balancing hash rate across all of these shards pretty equally. And we saw this in our test net that we launched last year and we had nine shards that were all operating and then it was kind of cool because you'd see the hash rate all sort of ebb and flow together and they'd all trend and then like one guy it's a test net but like one guy like jumps on one shard and like puts a ton of hash rate on and that like spikes and then everyone's like oh wait you're gonna you're like not making you know as much quad kind of on that equal basis if you were to spread out your hash rate so it's really cool to see that game theory design play out but from a user perspective for your question it's in the wallet would look all the same. So you just see Quai, it's that one interface and it's interacting with 
set of chains, but it's on the same network per se. And so you don't have to worry about that separation because you're going to get that same experience as opposed to there's a fundamental trade-off if I'm sending ETH on Optimism versus sending ETH on Ethereum because mm. I have different fees, I have different security guarantees, I have different trade-offs there. But if you're sending Quai on Quai Network, regardless of the shard, it's going to be the same experience. So I do have a question at the bounds of this design. Like, let's say, like, one of your shards is like really massively successful, and mm. let, let's say it's like a DeFi shard because it lends itself yeah. to this example pretty well. Um, well, now, like, it, doesn't it become a question of like, okay, well, now I have to split the DeFi shard because the DeFi shard has so much activity. Yet DeFi in its use case is like it, it very much benefits from the synchronous composability part. Right. So like back to this arbitrage case where now you have so much activity in DeFi that it needs to be on two shards, but you have economic deck like opportunities appearing in both. Like how do you deal with that ordering problem again? Like if the, you know, when the layer two system basically breaks down where, mm -hmm. you know, you want a general purpose layer two is not just like app chain layer twos, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we've, we've thought about this very deeply and we've, Consider designs in which the network sort of almost like a like a cell like splits like this like that same state that you're accessing would split off and I think you're sort of referencing that in your question or it's like we fragment it and now the DeFi shard kind of becomes two DeFi shards that's mm -hmm. not actually how Quai works because you sort of break composability you have bad references across contracts that reference each other and it would be pretty bad so what we've designed with Quai is that the address space is actually pre-allocated up to 225 shards ahead of time. And when we create shards, we're creating fresh state. So all that DeFi shard would sort of be unimpacted, everything would exist, but now we have all of this new block space. And all of this new block space is really attractive for people because it's not being used. And so it's almost like sort of a land rush opportunity where it's like, hey guys, there's like no fees over here. Let's go deploy our contracts and let's get set up and people mm. can go mine it. And now there's this area in which you're sort of like a westward expansion and we bring some of that kind of into the community and the culture vibes of it and the sort of fun memetic pieces. But that's truly how it kind of works. It's like there's this new untapped block space. It's pristine, it's fresh, evergreen. Go mine it, go deploy your stuff. Fees are going to be lower. And then over time, you'll see sort of that ac economic activity shift because it might not be everyone that's like super ingrained into that first shard. It might be some of the more ad hoc things, but as the network grows, it will become more robust. No, I like that. Awesome. Um, I, I'd love to touch on the the two token design uh, sure. that yeah. you talk about. I think you were saying that the stable coin is um, sort of ish. Yeah. Like energy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So. Yeah. So on Quai Network, we have two sort of fundamental primitives. We have that store value asset Quai, and then we have this new energy-based bunny called chi and chi literally like the chi life force inside of you is this token that is emitted proportionally to hash rate so tactically every time you give the network a hash you will receive some proportional amount of chi this mechanicalistically designs the price or tracks the price of chi to the price of energy because most of this hashing that is done on the network in terms of opex sort of less than initial capex costs is energy and you can oracleize work in order to bring this on chain and so this isn't like a real world asset it's more so of an endogenous proxy variable to real world energy and no other proof of work coin has done this bitcoin has considered like energy-based money because it has miners but its supply emissions are completely arbitrary satoshi made up for your havings and he was like, hey, guys, this is cool in theory. It's just going to have every four years. And now, like, we're left with these super memetic events. Like, the halving might happen on 420 this year. So everyone's like, holy shit, like, that's super cool. But also, it's like, why? Why do we have that? Like, that, there wasn't a lot of rational thought there. And, of course, now Bitcoiners will say, like, there's a ton of reasons that the halving exists. And we've made up all these things. But physically, if you go look at Bitcoin Talk, Satoshi was like, YOLO. Like, halvings are cool. And so we've thought deeply about how can we create a useful economic design in which we're taking that work and we're creating something that can make it more useful. So when we talk about, 
well, energy is bad for the environment, like all of these things. It has this real cost and we're creating these currencies, but now they're kind of just free floating. Well, with this two token dynamic, we can, as I said, oracleize it and then have this secondary token almost track the price of energy like a stable coin. It's not a stable coin. It's more of a free floating, non-pegged asset. And the way that we can bring in some forms of stability is by having miners essentially mine either Quai or Chi in each block. And when they mine Quai or Chi in each block, given they're on different supply curves, this creates a shelling point for that market equilibrium to trend towards a price of a hash for Chi. So I, I know that's kind of like the high so, level overview, but. Yeah, I guess a clarifying question there. Do, like, do the miners have to choose if they're mining one or the other? Yep. Okay. And so they'll and it, mine. If they, can they mine both? Like, is that a possibility? They can mine both alternatively. So you can't mine both in the same block. Okay. So every time you mine Chi, you forego the option of mining Kwai. Okay. And that, like, why is that decision made? Like, maybe that'll yeah. help me understand the mechanism. Yeah. So there better. has to be a way in which Chi, in terms of market responsiveness, can be introduced in parity with hash rate. And if you were to have a separate system in which Chi is being mined every block, that's extremely unstable because you're essentially introducing that proportional amount of hash rate into the currency supply every time. So Chi itself is neither inflationary or deflationary. It's market, market responsive because I can take my Chi and convert it to Kwai at the price of a hash. And if Chi isn't above the price of a hash, I won't choose to mine Chi. I will mine Kwai in that sort of store value Asset. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. So, so every time you choose to mine chi, you're mining chi at the price of a hash, which is super important. Okay, I see this. Yeah, I get this now. Okay, so then the oracle, like the oracle, like when you decide to mine a block, you lock in the oracle price at which yep. you want to like mine that block at. Yeah, and so it's the global average energy cost because these miners are distributed across the globe. There's for some of the six cents, like I said earlier, for Texas, 14 cents for Germany, Brazil, you name it, Thailand. So it's that average. And so they're bringing that Oracle that will sort of smooth out across everyone. Like kind of like our, our COO, David says, it's like a, you know, that like uh, that kind of like layered like meme where they're like uh, coming to like this realization, like the realization meme where it's like proof of work being used for transaction mining. That's like the first or like transaction inclusion or like block inclusion. That's the first step. And then it's proof of work as sort of block ordering and then having all of that block ordering and canonical consensus. And then it's proof of work as a way of determining market efficiency and having that come into price discovery and that mechanism there for sort of supply shocks. That's that third step. And then the fourth step, as I keep referencing, is this proof of work as an oracleization. So we are bringing these properties of the real world through proof of work into this crypto native internet money. So maybe I'll just try to summarize this now that I sure. understand it. And then, uh, yeah, maybe we, you, we can bounce it off to Dave from there and see his thoughts. So as I understand this right, um, essentially, like the, the store value asset, like the Bitcoin, right, mm -hmm. um, is being mined via like miners on the coin network, right? Yep. And through that, they're also tracking like an Oracle price of energy to do that mining of the store value asset, yep. right? When that goes under like the value of the store value asset or it's cheaper to mine the other one. Then there becomes an arbitrage opportunity at which the miner can say, hey, actually, I'm going to mine Chi because yep. it's underpriced right now. And there's a like a proof of work incentive to basically arbitrage it back into like alignment with the hash rate that's on the network. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. Yeah. And so okay. either... You know, you said either it's cheaper or it's more profitable too. So everything is based mm. off of that miner incentive. So just as miners move between layer ones, you don't see that as much anymore. I mean, of course, there's still some active communities, Ravencoin, Caspa, Alephium, you name it. But uh, GPUs are commodity hardware that can be used for everything. And so you would see this sort of demand decision in which they're sort of coming on or offline. And if they are mm. online, they're choosing between Quai or Chi. And if they're mining Chi, it's because Chi is more profitable than Quai. I mean, it, it sounds slightly like the Luna, um, you know, we, methodology that you could, yeah, change it, change the UST into Luna effectively. So, 
what happens during black swans what happens if sure. uh Kui is suddenly like you know bullish and it's done a hundred x in the space of a year? yeah yeah so that's an interesting comparison and that's like one of the first points we have to address so with terra luna you were able to natively mint it essentially for free to defend a peg so you were hyperinflating a supply to defend a physical dollar peg for mm -hmm. free that's a free mint in Kwai, with this Kwai chi pair dynamic you're creating chi at the price of a hash. That requires a real world mm. energy expenditure to create that asset at that hash rate. And so essentially if the hash rate is 100 hash a second, then you're creating 100 chi with some proportionality constant there. And if the hash rate drops, you're creating less chi. So there's that hash rate design that is a stabilizer. There's the real world economic input that's a stabilizer. And then of course, with this, there's no peg. So we're not saying that chi is going to be some mm. amount. It's a free floating asset and that's market designed so that there is no sort of circular reinvention there in which we have to sort of stop the line at a dollar per se. So that's why I don't label this a stable coin. It's not a stable coin. Everyone do your own research and take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, of course. And this is all super experimental still, given we're ahead of mainnet. But that is a lot of what our design has gone into is how do we create something that is not a, a dollar based or dollar denominated thing? Energy, from our perspective, is more vital to the economy. It's a better input. It's a better driver for inflation. If we have something that can pair with energy, then that might actually pair closer to purchasing power. And we might actually have more uh, flexibility and more of a capitalistic approach to having a monetary design based on that. So there's an interesting economic rabbit hole to dive into there. But from our side, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of one of the key things to dissuade is how do we prevent something like Terra Luna again? Because that actually really hurt the crypto ecosystem for some time. Awesome. Um, I think it'd be interesting to know because I think at the moment there's a couple of established ecosystems and anyone who's coming new this cycle is going to have to compete you know, with these very large network effects. So often people say you need, you're going to need like a 10x improvement plus. So what's your go-to-market strategy? How are you going to attract the degens to start uh, using Kwai. Yeah, culture is so important. Culture and community, and then of course technology paired together is like a winning strategy. The differentiation for Kwai is to leverage this technology and create a better experience. So when we talk about the addresses, when we talk about reducing MEV, when we talk about these work-based things, that's a really cool mousetrap in many ways. And you can sometimes win by creating a better mousetrap. People will go back to a lot of the classical examples of better technology not winning, but crypto is still figuring out what this technology even does, and there's many different iterations. So I think first and foremost, people that want to iterate on this design frontier with us are super excited about it, and we've cultivated that. We're bringing as much of that in as possible, and we appreciate everyone in the community that has kind of followed along for that. And then in terms of sort of the bridge items that get us into this category creation, we want to start with some of the things that we can do for MEV resistance with DeFi, that scalability in terms of low fees and perpetuity, keeping that sort of fee consistently low, sub penny, while creating this ample block space on demand. And then this intrinsic value token, I think is a really interesting property. So we wanna dive deep into those categories, own that market. We wanna really capture the proof of work market, create new opportunities there. If you look in terms of Proof of work versus proof of stake by market capitalization. I still think Bitcoin beats everyone out by far. And tapping onto those ecosystems and piggybacking off of that, I think will be a huge win. And then uh, as we solidify that, making those gaps and saying, this is novel, this is interesting, we can create our own category. We can create this mm -hmm. category of this energy-based money asset. We can create this category of scalable proof of work, and we can bring people into that. So like I sort of led in the podcast earlier, this proof of work renaissance we're extremely excited about. We want to bring people into this umbrella and we want to see what we can do to sort of like essentially make it cool again. And I think a lot of that other people would resonate with as well. I think Bitcoiners have felt pretty ostracized for some time. I think there's other evolving forms of proof of work that are interesting and novel as well. Like I mentioned earlier, Casper, Lepium, a few others. So the call outs there, I think would be how do we get all these protocols to work together? Because I, I still think, uh, as it kind of says in crypto, rising tide lifts all boats. And if we can create some cool things for other people to use as well, I see that as a win.
I so I was actually going to directly double click on that because uh, that was my question. You know, you talk about uh, Bitcoin Renaissance. I think like mm-hmm. Bitcoin is going through its own, you know, soul searching of finding new use cases. Um, you see on like, you know, the proof of stake side with Ethereum, uh, a lot of blockchains now offering, you know, segments of their blockchain as yeah. either like DA or something else, you know, uh, ordering, you know, shared sequencer networks. Right. Um, do, how do you see Quai like working, you know, with other proof of work or proof of stake ecosystems? And like, is, is there like aspects of it that it can basically just like integrate to yeah. like basically have, you know, some sort of like a DA to a settlement layer relationship or something like that? Yeah, I, I think we referenced that Babylon use case earlier. You could very well see something like that for Quai, where you have proof of stake systems timestamping onto a more lively and sort of robust settlement layer in terms of economic finality with proof of work. That's super interesting. And then beyond that, Quai, of course, can offer up blob space so that you can have other people settling on top of that, providing their data directly to it. So with that block space, as I said, on terms of adaptive demand, you can make that blob space. I think hmm. the consensus finality around that and the ability to shard that is still interesting. I think I've actually talked on Twitter with Anatoly about that, where we were saying like a sharded system design kind of paired with a Mina ZK proof approach is interesting and novel. So I'd have to go find that thread. But there is some areas to explore there. And of course, we want to be highly interconnected. So how do we get the bridges? How do we get the sort of access hmm. and liquidity? And I think course that improves the efficiency across all of these layers and the trade-off is just now that we have these scalability and low fee options from the beginning that's a non-starter you have to have that if you're launching that in today's day and age you don't know what you're doing so you have to have low fees but now i think the use case will come around and i think the pendulum is swinging back and using that terminology again is like what is my decentralization aspect and how censorship resistant is this because if the user experience and I, again, don't mean to shit on base for other layer twos, but if the user experience is I've signed up on Coinbase and then I use the base L2, then that's not crypto to me. That's like a, a you know completely centralized kind of belief. And I'm, I think that's fine if people are like retails here and I can go trade meme coins, but we see the sort of broader vision of interconnectivity with censorship resistant global monetary settlement and scale in which everyone can sort of freely own that without risk of either the sequencer going down or or stuff getting censored or delayed and, and different trade-offs there. So, Awesome. And maybe final question, but um, what should we be looking forward to? Um, what the next milestones? Yeah. Yeah, so we just closed our third test nut. Great traction and participation from the community. And we sort of proved out proof of entry minima. We proved out the sharding. And we proved out this design. We are approaching our fourth test net, the Golden Age test net, and we're on track for mainnet this summer. So people can follow us on Twitter, at Quai Network. They can jump in the Discord. They can post some memes and chime in there. And of course, you can always reach me on Twitter as well. We can drop some of those links down below after the show and would love to chat with more people on the design and debate different interesting topics that we covered today. Can users participate in the testnet? Yeah, so the testnet's still running. It's no longer incentivized for miners. That was the main piece of incentivization that we had. But we do have apps up. You can go mint some NFTs and you can do cool things on testnet today. We're going to be doing a lot more incentivization on this next fourth testnet. So we'll have more announcements there. We just actually announced our grants program for builders, which will kind of coincide with our next testnet. So if you're a builder, definitely encourage you to reach us directly, apply for that. If you do apply, let me know. But we'd love to bring new apps onto Quai Network and utilize a lot of these fundamental primitives to get a better user experience. So it is, uh, just for clarity for that, it is EVM, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So Solidity. Yep. So, yeah. Cool. Few, few minor modifications, but we have ways of helping with that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think um, it's a great place to stop, but it's been an awesome conversation. I think we learned a, a load about this uh, really interesting and novel network. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing it go live in the summer. Can't wait. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your time today. Yeah, it was, it was great chatting, man. Mm-hmm.